All right, moving on to other materials used in construction. This is part two of unit seven, construction materials. One quick note to remind you again, please, if you have not done so already, go to our Butte College bookstore online. There's no reason for you to actually go physically to the bookstore, but go to the bookstore online and please try and order the book and the complimentary set of prints that go with the book. This will be the last unit that we're not using the prints. Once we're complete uh, with this unit and the test, um, you will uh, most certainly be needing the book and the prints. So do your best to try and get that. Thank you. Division 4, Masonry. So there's a difference between the world of concrete and the world of masonry. And the difference is how the reaction of making the hardened material is actually done. So in the concrete process, what we've learned so far is that it's a chemical reaction between water and cement, <clears throat> which is a hydrating reaction that causes the hardening of the material around all of the aggregate materials, around all of the uh, reinforcing bars to ultimately make for a complete unitized, uh, hardened, strong construction material. With masonry, the difference is that brick or clay tile or even stone-based tile is often and I would say almost exclusively the differentiation here is that brick requires some form of heat input. So in other words, it's still a chemical mixture of basic materials and water, but the process to actually catalyze it is heat. So you fire brick. That means you subject it to a high amount of heat for a period of time. And in that high amount of heat for a period of time, the uh, reaction causes the water to essentially evaporate away, resulting in the hardened material. All right. So some of the brick that we may encounter in the world of construction might be things like adobe brick, kiln burned, sand lime concrete, building, face, glazed, fire brick, and paving. So these are different types of products. Now you notice that concrete is in the middle of that. We also talked about something called a concrete masonry unit. So yes, our brick terminology can be applied to concrete, but I want you to be aware that the, there is a difference in the reaction and that difference in the reaction is what ultimately causes the material to be classified as masonry, not as concrete. So in the world of brick, we often get into positioning of brick in certain configurations that are sometimes aesthetic, sometimes are for some form of strength and unitizing strength. So as you can see, we have different names that are applied to them. Stretcher, header, soldier, sailor, rowlock, rowlock stretcher, and course. Most often here in the Western United States, we see coarse brick, C-O-U-R-S-E, not C-O-A-R-S-E. But if you go to uh, any place around Northern California and look at a brick configuration, you would most likely see coarse brick. Occasionally you might see a row lock stretcher or a row lock, but if you look at the configuration that's being shown here on the screen, you kind of get a sense that part of the reason for the different configurations might be an insulating property between an interior wall and an exterior wall. It might be for a certain uh, aesthetic, example being the soldier or the sailor uh, type of brick environment where you have a certain way that the brick is going to be configured to accomplish um, 
the aesthetic look that we're looking for. So we're not going to study too much. I'm uh, unlikely to give you any type of uh, uh, question that's going to tell you, you know, give a tell that I'm going to be interested in soldier and sailor. Uh, but there may be one one question about brick positioning in the test. So uh, some of the types of masonry walls that you might see, one would be that this uh, concept of width, W-Y-T-H-E, or width, is uh, it's, a, it's an old English term that's applied to the fact that the entirety of that wall that's shown on the left is brick, that no matter what, the cross-section of it is brick. So in that sense, the entirety of the wall, um, and if you kind of think about it as uh, uh, the Three Little Pigs parable, that really was an interesting parable about uh, the strength of masonry walls that you know you can huff and puff and blow your house down with twigs and sticks and all that. But by the time you got to brick, that single width of brick was able to withstand the blowhard of the wolf. When you get into things like composite walls, you're getting into a sharing of the wall that is maybe decorative as an applique of exterior brick, but on the interior side, it may be less that it is uh, adobe brick that you would see on the exterior and maybe a different configuration of brick on the interior. The insulating properties remain the same. The, the holding properties of the brick remain the same. <clears throat> Always remember that with brick, you have great compressive strength, just like you have with concrete. But without reinforcing, you don't have much in the way of flexibility with that brick once it's all put together. That flexibility can be increased when you add something like a cavity in between. That's a, an air barrier that exists between the two walls. Now, to deviate just a little bit from that, one of the things that made the Bidwell Mansion in Chico the uh, very much uh, architectural marvel of its day, which at the time it was commissioned by John Bidwell in the plans uh, in the late 1850s, and then ultimately uh, it was completed around uh, 1867, 1868, was the fact that it was one of the first houses in all of California at the time to incorporate insulation in the walls. Now this insulation was air. There is literally an interior wall and an exterior wall with an air entrainment in between. And that air was intended to be a barrier to the types of weather that we typically see here in Northern California, which is the mild winter, we don't get too much into the freezing, but we do get fog and we do get cold. And in the summertime, we go from that to heat and we can go from a relatively mild morning in the high 60s and low 70s to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit around midday. So Bidwell commissioned this home to incorporate something new in the day, which was an insulated wall. So this idea of a cavity wall, as you see here in the third from the left, is something that was uh, kind of characterized you know, 150, 160 years ago as being new and different, but today is used in brick construction pretty readily. Now the last one on the right is something called a veneer, and that is looking at the structure of the wall. The wall itself really has no weight bearing or load bearing or structural integrity that's held to the courses of brick. The brick is applied as a veneer. That's a fancy way of saying that the veneer is for an aesthetic. It's for a look of the way we want the brick uh, to show, uh, but it is not uh, necessarily used for structural integrity. I can tell you that most of the construction, uh, brick construction in particular, out here in the west, and by that I mean uh, really west of the Mississippi River, uh, we are looking at veneer type brick more than we're looking at a single width or a composite uh, wall. East Coast, uh, original 13 colonies, you get into a lot of single width uh, brick 
construction of the day. Much different in terms of the uh, geographic areas as well to deal with some of the uh, seismic differences between West Coast and East Coast. We obviously know that West Coast, we have a lot of issues with earth earthquakes, which makes veneer more attractive because the structural integrity of the uh, built environment is maintained. It might uh, result in the brick falling off, but the brick falling off as a veneer may not result in a structural rebuild of the built environment. It may just be that the reapplication of the veneer is sufficient. So we, we can get the look of brick, we can get the architectural in, in, uh, effect of brick, but we don't necessarily have to rely on the structural uh, integrity of the brick out here in the West. Other types of masonry involve stones. So you get into granite, stones, marbles, sandstones, field stones, slates, and cut stones that are removed from a quarry. So cut stones removed from a quarry, really a, a classic example of that is that, you know, not too far away from the large structures that are built uh, and are cut, uh, you're going to find that there's a quarry. So not too far outside of Washington, D.C. as an example you're going to find that there are multiple quarries around the state of uh, Virginia and Maryland so that the areas surrounding Washington, D.C. were used to take that cut stone and make our uh, capital structure, they, uh, our, our uh, structures of uh, import for uh, memorials and so on and so forth. Out here in the West, we see a lot of granite. Uh, we see a lot of limestone as well uh, in areas uh, there in uh, the European areas we see a lot of marble Italy is very uh, much known for its marble uh, sandstone and fieldstone uh, we know a little bit more out here in the West more than anything else because of the large expanses of desert type environments so these are different materials that are common to the world of masonry and that can be harvested, they can be cut, they can be taken from one area of our existence in a natural state to a constructed state uh, relatively um, easily or I should say relatively uh, comprehensively so that they can be done in, in uh, large amounts. So uh, we also get into things like rubble and ashlar and cut stones. So with rubble wall, for example, I'm going to I'm going to be looking at kind of that irregularity. That's really common. We see that a lot in uh, in kind of cabin construction where you you have a lot of uh, stones that are put together, and then they have the mortar placed in between each one of the stones. They kind of interlock together, but they're varying in shape and size. If it's ashlar, then it's squared off. It's laid in a pattern, but it isn't necessarily cut to a specific dimension. So you might see some irregularities in length as you look at the structure, but the patterning is very distinctive. Um, ashlar was used very commonly by uh, an architect back in the early 1900s named Frank Lloyd Wright. So I encourage you to take a look and do a little Googling on Frank Lloyd Wright. And it's an uh, amazing amount of uh, work that he did in advancing the combination of aesthetics and functionality. And lastly, cut stone, we cut it, we mill it, we take it to a particular dimension and, and then we finish it according to a particular design. So this is often used with things like marble. Um, cut stone today would be used very commonly in contemporary kitchens or bathrooms with things like quartz countertops granite countertops and so forth. They're cut and milled to a particular size and shape. So you can see here this idea of a rubble wall up in the upper left and all the way to seeing some of the different ashlar type structures. Uh, our typical just coarse masonry is uh, put into a pattern and resembles an awful lot of what you would typically see in a coarse brick wall. Stacked ashlar Again, you get that sense of that pattern that you see of one solid brick right next to um, the half height bricks and then further broken up into the half width bricks 
and that's done in kind of a random patterning uh, that you see, and then the random patterning at the broken end. So these are different aesthetics. They don't necessarily change the overall and structural integrity of the walls, uh, but they are definitely looking for an architectural affectation and could potentially be looking at some function as well. But these are some characteristics that we would see and things that you might see on an exterior elevation of a plan set to depict the type of wall structure that's uh, being asked for. So when we get to clay tile, um, it is similar to brick, but it's usually larger. So a tile is usually larger in its width um, and depth, but it's not as thick as brick. So sorry for the uh, Jethro Tull uh, uh, reference there. Not as thick as a brick, but uh, look that up on YouTube if you'd like. And in our work with a tile, that thickness might have an affectation to be used maybe in a load-bearing uh, wall, maybe in a backup for a curtain wall. A curtain wall is a different type of wall that you typically see in a commercial environment. And it might be used for fireproofing around structural steel. But the idea is that it's not as thick. It can make a nicer uh, veneer, but it can also be incorporated into the structure. So now we move on to the glue that exists for the different types of structures that we're putting together. Whether we're talking about concrete masonry units put together into a cinder block wall, or we're talking about courses of brick, or we're talking about an ashlar uh, pattern, we're talking about the use of mortar. And mortar is um, broken up into types. And you can see here M, S, N, O, and K, high compressive strength, good durability, high strength, stronger bonding, general use. I can tell you right now that one in the middle that is type N is the one that we're most likely to see here in the West. Type O, low strength that's used for interior non-bearing masonry. You might see that when you're making a fireplace. The, the actual structural integrity is done with fire brick and done with the exterior brick. But the, the fireplace, the aesthetic of the fireplace may be low strength for interior. It often it's a little slower to uh, flash off and hydrate so that you get a, a nicer, um, less prone to cracking kind of a view in the, in the mortaring itself. Mortar is made up of a combination of Portland cement, which is, as we know, the, either the type 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5, uh, typically types 1 and 2. With a type N, that means that the combination of type 1 and 2 are combined together with sand or a very fine grit to form the mortar that we're looking for. It's very easy to apply. It, it has good, what I kind of refer to as stiction, and it works really, relatively well uh, for uh, the combining of the bricks together. Sometimes you'll see bricks that are actually stacked on top of each other. We'll see that more in a horizontal environment where it may make up a patio and be locked together with sand in between the bricks. But if you're going to talk about any vertical structure, any verticality at all, you're going to see mortar in between those structures. So <clears throat> when we talk about different materials, I'm going to shift away from concrete and masonry into an area of what we call division five, which is metals. So in metals, you might see a variety of uses of metallic things, such as studs, beams, joists, windows, doors. You might see metal used in roofing, plumbing, and hardware. What's important to note about metals is that there's a distinction in the metal in its application and it doesn't necessarily include the manufacturing process. So for example, if we're talking about metal studs, beams, or joists, then we're talking about things that are commonly available from a manufacturer. We're not necessarily talking about the actual uh, chemical um, and structural integrity of the material itself. In other words, there's not likely going to be an inspector coming on site who's actually going to be looking for a sample of the I-beam used 
to hold up a large expanse of um, subfloor over a basement uh, to determine the chemical and um, strength properties of this material. It's going to be accepted that from the manufacturer it meets a set of standards and a set of requirements that are expected in the engineering process of calculating what the need is in the subfloor itself. So <clears throat> when we talk about metals, we do talk about the typical nature of ferrous materials. It's magnetic, um, usually uses iron, and in its, uh, in its structural sense, then the lower uh, structural uh, capabilities of iron exist versus the higher structural capabilities of steel, and we get into um, the different uh, types of ferritic um, structure, uh, but all have in common that it has some sense of magnetic property. Now you get into a little bit of uh, uh, high nickel content steel, something that is so high in nickel and chromium as an example, where we refer to it as stainless steel. And the ferritic properties, the amount of magnetic uh, properties that it holds is actually a lot lower. But the trade-off is, is that it doesn't, it doesn't have that typical uh, water intrusion barrier, which I like to, that's what I like to refer to rust as, is we don't have that circumstance to account for anymore. It's more uh, stainless, it's, it's more of that um, preferred, maybe a preferred aesthetic. Not typically used, stainless is not typically used from a structural standpoint, it's usually from an aesthetic standpoint. Non-ferritic materials, uh, they don't have any iron, they don't have any uh, magnetic properties, they're usually lighter in weight. Uh, aluminum is very common for that, copper, brass, bronze, which you know ultimately is a bronze is a combination of all those things including another product like tin, uh, but there's no magnetic properties to it. So aluminum you might see used, and you can even see it used in electrical wire. Um, copper you can see it used in electrical wire, you see it used in plumbing, you see it used in even roofing material. Uh, brass you might see used in uh, door uh, fenestration hardware. So what I'm saying there is doors, windows, drawer pulls, door pulls, those kinds of things. And then bronze you might see as some sort of aesthetic uh, architectural uh, effect on the built environment. So if we're talking about any of those ferritic and non-ferritic materials, there are ways that we can coat them, we can treat them so that they will be impervious to uh, moisture, they will be impervious to color change or um, some type of chemical in, uh, property that takes place. But then there are some times where we actually want to impart a chemical property change. For example, with copper, we might really like that shiny copper look, which means we're probably going to apply some other type of material that looks like copper but probably isn't, something a little bit more like brass. Or we're going to enjoy the natural weathering of copper where it turns green and has that kind of what we call patina look to it. It's kind of a blotchy green color, but that's all protective coating. Once that patina is adhered to and coated the copper, it won't do any more reacting. Same thing with rusting. It's, uh, it's a layer of protective coating over the steel. Once that happens, the steel will no longer react. Electroplating, uh, also referred to as powder coating, is that I'm going to apply an electrical charge. I'm going to I'm going to have some form of um, heat that's imparted by way of that electrolysis process, and then ultimately it gets uh, plated or finished in a way that makes for a very hard, very tough coating, same as galvanizing or chroming. Now. We want to make sure that if it does call for galvanizing and we have steel that has to be incorporated in that, that we're concerned about things like welding or other types of processes where the galvanizing can be harmful to us as humans. Um, so often, and particularly in the state of California, we don't do a lot of 
chroming and galvanizing anymore inside the state of California. We import that from other states. Doesn't make California better. It just means that there's been more care and concern for the humanity, less care and concern for the amount of cost that's associated with having chroming or galvanizing nearby. One thing that you will find on the test is that we get to a place where we have metals that are less than a quarter inch in thickness are typically referred to in a gauge. So for example, the largest gauge or quarter inch thick material is going to be the, in a sheet thickness as you can see here that where the lower number, the lower number, so look across there for number four, steel manufacturer's gauge number, has the highest pounds per square foot in weight, so pounds per PSF, pounds per square foot, that a number four gauge, which is very close in thickness, it's 0.2242 inches, where a quarter of an inch in decimal form is 0.25 inches, it's thick enough that it weighs over nine pounds per square foot, where we get down to almost paper thin, actually, you know, potentially even less than paper thin, almost the thickness of a human hair, 38 gauge material, you have only a quarter of a pound per square foot. So you, you can see that that metal gauge, the lower the number, the higher the weight per square foot, the higher or thicker the material, the higher the gauge number, the less amount of weight per square foot, and far less in equivalent thickness. So you may find that there's a question or two on there. Think gauges and gauge materials like 10 gauge, 12 gauge, 14 gauge, 16 gauge will definitely enter into a lot of construction projects. And there is a use of gauge thickness for wire as well, and we'll cover that in another unit. So structural steel, again, as I mentioned earlier, this is a term that's applied to the, the hot rolling process, the shape and the configuration of its shape made in the manufacturing environment. In other words, there's no heating and smelting and rolling and uh, development of that steel from a flat plate or from a, uh, a hot um, pour condition into its shape on site. That's all done off-site in a manufacturing environment. Different type of process. But once it hits the construction project, it's usually a lot like putting together um, fit piece A into slot B. So if any of you are familiar with the old days of things like erector sets and those kinds of things, it's very much the same as that. Another analogy might be Legos, that you have different Lego configurations, uh, six blocks, four blocks, eight blocks, and so forth. And you put them together and you form a structure. So the hot rolled steel section shape and plate is what we refer to in general as structural steel. So steel can have beam designations, like for example, a W12 by 16 says that this beam is 12 inches deep and weighs 16 pounds per lineal foot. The depth is associated with the top and bottom and the amount of distance in between a top and a bottom of a beam. So in this case 12 inches between top and bottom is that W12 designator. If I have an angle beam then I might have an L3 by 3 by 1 half which says that both of the legs of the angle are 3 inches. So I have an angle perpendicularity represented one leg three inches, the other leg three inches, and then the entire thickness of the material of each of those legs is one half inch. So L3 by three, or sometimes it's referred to as an L3 angle, is that designator. So here's an example. This is a table. This is also in your reference section that you have wide flange shapes. You have all the way down to things like Z shapes, T shapes, um, and these different configurations are engineered into the structure to do and behave in a certain way.
for all of the material to unitize together and form a structure that has integrity and can withstand the weight, it can withstand the weather, it can withstand the natural uh, incorporation of things like seismic events and so forth. So when we get into wood, wood is usually classified in, in a way that we think of, um, and if you just use the analogy of a pencil, which is usually wood, right? It's high in strength in compression and tension. In other words, I can bite a pencil and I probably, you know, unless I've got an amazing set of teeth, I, it's going to be hard for me to bite through. So it has a high amount of compression strength. And if I turn that pencil on an end and I cut it to a small enough length and try to do the same squeeze with my teeth, I know I can't actually cut it. It probably would split before I would lose the structural integrity of its length. So if you think of it that way, then wood has very high strength. It's also relatively flexible and it's a beautiful aesthetic in, in a historic to contemporary sense that wood has that classic timeless look for it. So we use it often in rough carpentry for things like studs and structural framing to finish carpentry for cabinetry. Now the classification for hard for wood is either in hard wood form or soft wood form. Note to self, wink wink, there's probably a question on the test about that. It's not classified as long or short, it's not classified as uh, as you know, painted or not painted, it's classified as hardwood or softwood. And this gets into how the growth process of the wood takes place in the combination of cellular structure and tightness of the rings around the tree, what the tree was subjected to in the form of uh, health over time, and so forth. So hardwood, softwood. So hardwoods would be things like maples. They would be things like oak. The softwood would be pine or ash. So you can see here that in um, our work, and I misspoke, I said ash was a softwood, it's more of a hardwood, but you can see there the oak, the walnut, and maple are hardwoods, whereas things like redwoods, Douglas fir, pines, and so forth are softwoods. So those wood classifications and types of woods, you might have a question or two on the test. So this is a good discussion about how we get into the classification of a surface to size. And this is where the whole idea of surfacing comes into place and also the size. A two by four is not two by four. A two by four is actually a cross section of inch and a half by three and a half. Now this was done over the course of time. If some of you live in a home that was probably pre-1935 or so, you might have two by fours that are actually dimensional lumber of two inches by four inches on its cross section thickness. At some point moving forward from that, and this happened primarily during the post-World War II urbanization of the United States, there was a, an unfortunate uh, circumstance that we couldn't keep up with the amount of need. So what we decided as a, a, a nation and associations of lumber uh, was to change the classification of a cross section of a two by four from two inches by four inches to inch and five-eighths by three and five-eighths. And what this did was it changed the amount of pieces of lumber you could get out of a milled tree. And so we saw an increase of somewhere around 15 to 20 percent, which pretty much covered us uh, for a considerable period of time. Then we got into the even greater large urban sprawl of the 1960s and the 1970s. We went through that problem again, and then ultimately the lumber that we know today as a two by four in a really kind of a real language sense, when you put a tape measure on it, it is not two inches by four inches. I just want to make that clear. It's actually inch and a half by three and a half at its cross section. There is still rough sawn 
dimensional lumber available as a 2x4. The other thing that's important to note, particularly when you get into finished lumber sizing, is that there may be two surfaces or two sides that are finished, or you may get some that are finished on all four sides. So that finish means that it's a relatively smooth cut, not necessarily paintable or uh, that you can stain it or that you can finish it as you would finish in a cabinet sense, but it does fit um, this categorization of a finish by its process through a mill. And so S2S and S4S is really popular. We also get into S2S with sheet products, so with things like oriented strand board, particle boards, and the world of plywood, we get into S2S all the time. So plywood is made of, of several layers. The grain position is um, opposing each other at right angles, so there's perpendicular direction of the grain between layers. And it's usually done in an odd number of layers so that you always have a center core and you have an external uh, face and a, another external face followed by two filler spaces in between. So that would be a five layer. So you want the grain of the face and the back running in the same direction. So in other words, the grain direction of one side of a 4 by 8 sheet of plywood, which is usually the grain running along the 8 foot length of a, two, of a 4 by 8 sheet. If you flip it over, the grain direction is the same front and back. And the panel thicknesses can range in eighth of an inch thick over to over an inch thick in actual thickness. So this is really important to, to note that you know plywood is a very uh, prescriptive manufacturing process. Um, it's done in a way so that we maximize the predictability of the strength of the wood. Because plywood is often used in things like shear wall design, or it's used in uh, subfloors and uh, and joist configurations, and it's used in other areas where plate designs out of plywood are commonly used. So plywood has a very specific way that it comes together. It's an engineered product. It is manufactured. It's not put together on a job site. Same thing with glue laminated timber, so what we often refer to as a glue lamb. This is a layer of large uh, structural lumber, like a 2x8, a 2x10, a 2x12, bonded together um, face to face, face to face, face to face. It could be that a, a 12 inch glue lamb might be uh, 20, 20 faces glued together and can withstand a tremendous amount and hold a tremendous amount of weight. They're used often in arches and beams and again just like plywood are prefabricated at a factory. Usually very expensive. The transportation of a glue lamb is very expensive as well. It does provide a, a certain aesthetic and a certain view that architecturally is attractive. Uh, but the structure outweighs the architecture in its, uh, in its desired uh, effect. We need it to hold up a large amount of weight. 